Right, so welcome back to the podcast. We're joined today by Martin Gill. He's the CEO of Rugrats Rugby, also starting his motivational speaking career. Ex- well, he was the last head coach of uh, England, winning the Europeans and coaching in the World Cup 2017 alongside Twig. And he's been the head coach of Leeds Rhinos as well, starting off their build to success last year. With with that said, hello, Mark, Martin. Hi, how you doing, Jack? You all right? Yeah, I'm not too bad, pal. The, uh, starting on the Leeds success, obviously, you messaged me after the grand final. How did uh, how was that win for Leeds for you? Amazing. You know, I, I think, you know, obviously, starting off that journey with Leeds in 2013 was... Um, a very hard process, you know, I think first and foremost it was instilling the, the foundations of the belief, but, you know, I was actually in Barcelona at the time of the grand final and um, I was keeping an eye on, obviously, on the score and it, when, it, when I saw the score at half time, I, we were supposed to be going out, bearing in mind I'm there for the weekend and we actually stayed in for a bit. Uh, my girlfriend's going, are we going out yet? And I'm like, darling, Leeds are winning in the grand final you know, <laughs> so it did it did mean a lot obviously I'd left him two years previously but you know it was it was great to see him get the job done yeah i thought they, they implemented a lot of uh values that you sort of instilled into them when you started coaching with them really putting in a structure and playing with level heads kind of thing i think that's what really clinched them the victory in the end yeah, and I think, listen, take nothing away from them, you know, my, my job at that time as, you know, Andy Gardner brought me in to, to really put some foundations in place. I've been involved in the running game for a number of years. Um, you know, I challenged the status quo within Wheelchair Rugby League. I think there's no there's no bounds about that. I've made some friends and made some enemies along the way, but I think if you look at Leeds in terms of what they did there, we, we did the hard yards. We put in those three, those three years of of hard work, but I think, you know, take nothing away from them. You know, people said, what does it feel like I'm winning? And, you know, they kicked on, you know, for me, it was about those foundations, but the success is down to them and what they've continued to do and build since I've, since I've departed. Yeah. The, um, we'll go a little bit into how, so exactly how did you, were you approached by Andy getting started in the leagues? Cause obviously you were doing the, the running game for a bit. Yeah. I'd, um, I'd put a States out. I'd actually been, I'd not been coached for a while. Obviously, you know, for me, coaching had been a big part of my life. I progressed and um, was obviously coaching in professional ranks up at Gateshead. And I took some time out after that. I was working on obviously the business, which I know we're going to sp- uh, talk about later on, but I missed it. I missed, I missed the team environment. Um, and I think, you know, for me on a personal level as well, I missed that sense of being involved with people and that camaraderie and having that team effort. And I just put a Facebook status out one day just saying I'm looking to return to coaching. If anybody knows of any opportunities, um, drop me a message. And it was actually uh, Nicola Butler, uh, Josh's mum, who dropped me a message and just said, would you be interested in coaching uh, wheelchair rugby league? And I'll be honest with you, I've never even heard of it. And yeah. I was like, I was like uh, what, what do you mean wheelchair rugby league? I know they've been involved with spiders. So I'd heard, a, I'd heard the spider why had been mentioned a, a few times, but, didn't really think anything about it. And I just said, listen, I'll, I'll come along and I'll take a look. It might be for me, it might not, but um, let's come and I'll have an on and take a look. I've got an open mind, so I, I was intrigued by to see what it was, what it was like. And it was nothing what I thought it was going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> what What were your initial thoughts of wheelchair rugby league? Like being um, that you didn't know what the sport was or what it entailed, what was your first initial thoughts on what it would be? Don't worry, it's just my camera messing up. Uh, that's fine. Um, I think if you, uh, when, I, when I first went along, I'll be honest with you, I didn't, I always thought, okay, it's, it's rugby league, but it's in a wheelchair. Okay, how's it been adapted? I didn't know if it were going to be these, you know, these powered wheelchairs where you'd actually, because obviously like, you see football on there where you have your powered wheelchairs and stuff. So I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit nervous, and a little bit apprehensive going along. I didn't really know what to expect. I, I kind of thought, well, I know how you play rugby league, but how the hell do you do that in a wheelchair? You know, so for me, I was kind of like really intrigued, but I'll be honest with you, I didn't have a clue. But I think from them first couple of sessions, I quite easily picked up that this is probably the closest to the adaptation of a sport that I'll, you'll ever possibly see. You know, it is, it is rugby league in a wheelchair. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's lots of transferable skills involved, isn't it? And, and it's just easy to see it and recognise what it is rather than thinking, right, so what, what's different yeah, from it there? Easy. How is it like easy. it? You know, you keep it, keep it. Yeah, so in, when uh, starting with the Leeds team then, so what were your first, init- when you really agreed to start coaching, what did you think about um, in terms of what were the processes you wanted to put forward then to help them improve? Because at that time, Leeds were obviously, uh, the, yeah. they won't mind me saying they were the whipping boys at that time, but the, the we, uh, what was the, the skill and sets and the process that you put in place for them anyway? I, I think first and foremost, Jack, we took them actually away from the rugby league and it, was, it wasn't was actually about the rugby, it was just about instilling some self-belief in them as individuals. Um, I think it was a case of understanding what we need to do. Cause, uh, you know, the teams that I've worked with and the teams that you build, if you can build the people up, I think the performance has come. So it was very much, how do we get you believing in yourself before you can actually do anything and and that was a lot of hard work I'll be honest with you I used to leave after some sessions and I'd sit in the car and I'd be like what the hell have I done you know because it, it as you say that you know they were they were known as the whipping boys back then you know it, it was a very hard transition from getting their foot on the ladder um but yeah it was very much about building the building the individuals getting to know each of them individually as well and understanding what makes them tick and why they were involved in the game because if I could understand that, then I had a way to actually be able to play to that, to be able to say, okay, this is what it means to you as an individual. How do we develop your skill base? Um, yeah, and then we just got to work. You know, we worked really, really hard. And I think a lot of people don't see the amount of hard work that went went into that team. And, and right in the service, obviously, it was behind closed doors. But I just know that they're probably one of the hardest working teams on and off the field. Um that I've done the, done the work over the last five years and I think that's shown in the fact that how they've closed the gap and obviously they becoming champions last year. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. So you, you sort of, your first approach was, you know, get the players to know each other and, and, and for you to to get to really know them players because it's the same um, tip that Mark actually gave us on the podcast. He was saying the main thing for a coach to do is learn who your players really are kind of thing. Yeah. It's quite good to see that. Yeah, definitely. And and, and all the fact that Mark's using my tips, it's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, we covered covered it with Mark a little bit. And uh, you've got a great report, uh, you and him. And like he said, you're sort of both on the same page with your ideas and, and your beliefs within sports and things like that. Do you agree with that, how you work together or do you yeah, think there's another I think aspect? I, he, I think when he applied for the position, I'd only been involved in the game for a few months. Um, and obviously at that time it came up that it was going to be, you know, the England Knights and it was that, creating that pathway for the next development. And when they announced that obviously I'd, I'd been appointed joint head coach of that team with Mark, I'd never even met Mark. I didn't even, we'd never even come up against Medway at that time, so I didn't even know who he was. So, for somebody who's quite naturally been used to being a head coach in their own right, for me it was kind of, well, okay, I, I genuinely didn't know how that was going to work because obviously you have your own ideas and you have your own beliefs and concepts and how you want to um, coach a team. So, to be able to be sharing that with somebody that I'd never even met or even spoken to at that stage, you know, it could have been quite a, quite a risky decision but I think I think once we'd had those initial conversations we spoke a couple of times on the phone and I think it was it became quite apparent quite quickly um, that our ethos and our beliefs around coaching and around development was was the same and you know I think I speak for both of us when um, when I say you know we worked together for three years and there wasn't a single crossword yeah you know, I think we agreed on a lot of things but we also had our own opinions on things and um, but we worked that through and I think you know that's testament to the, the actual work that we did with England. Well, yeah. So the f- the first thing you were um, you two were head coach for was that Euro challenge. Was it the Four Nations first? Was it? So we did the Four Nations with the with the Knights, and then obviously you know we stepped up. Then obviously it became obviously that that one team again in terms of the structure. Um, I think we quite easily saw that there was an opportunity to have a bigger squad um, working within that England structure. And, and yeah, the Euros was obviously the first time that. I think for us, you know, 
as head coach in terms of working with the full um, full squad, really. Yeah, that and in the in the Euros, obviously, it was a, a great success. How do um, how were your where were your headspace at at that point going into the Euros with a, with all the pressure that was put on the team? Yeah, there was a hell of a lot of pressure, Jack. You know, I think first and foremost, I think. I think people now see the end result, they see the trophy, but for me, the biggest success wasn't lifting that trophy. I think it was instilling a culture that was about development. I think we very much blooded quite a few new players into that structure and that environment, but it, but it was building for the future. And I'll be honest with you, if we'd, have, if we'd have lost that final, I'd have still stood by that that campaign would have been a success. Um, mm-hmm. And the fact that I think we've, people are now working hard for that shirts again in terms of the can see a clear pathway. Um, so I think the success goes beyond what we did on field, but don't get me wrong. Obviously, we loved what we achieved, but from a mindset point of view, yeah, it was it was tough. Um, a lot of pressure. I think we had to obviously we were stepping up to prove ourselves. Obviously, you know, some of the senior players had obviously been around that environment for a, a while, um, and I think it was building that trust with with that team and those players to actually say, you, you know, you've got to you've got to believe in what we're trying to create here. And I think it was very much about building the team and as individuals off the field again to be able to have that success on the field. Yeah, there was a lot of, uh, it was a really good sort of, the whole tournament sort of seemed to be like a, a, a team building and, and growing relationships between players and coaches and things like that. It obviously works, doesn't it? Yeah, I think we've got that, I think we've got that balance right. I think, you know, at times we can have a laugh and we can bring ourselves down to a level where we can actually say, you know, we're, we're a team, we're, we're in this together. But I think the, the relationship that's been built is, you know, when we knew we had to get to work and we, where the boundaries were and, you know, those principles that we'd instilled that, you know, there were quite clear boundaries of, you know, coach and players. But at the same time, I think first and foremost, you know, it's, it was about building those relationships to be able to, I guess, have an approachable and a, and a non-blame culture. You know, I think it was very much about, we have an open door policy. We can speak about anything we want. You know, it's a safe environment for us as a team. And I think once people got their head around that, we, we were able to probably speak quite open, quite freely about where we felt that we needed to improve, what we needed to do. But, but equally, have a bit of a laugh and a, and a giggle and, and have a bit of banter, which I think is important for a team. You know, it's not just about results and winning. It's about creating that environment and creating something that people want to be involved in because they actually enjoy it. We uh, we just had our England camp this weekend. Actually, we're doing a, a workshop in the classroom about working out what kind of um, players we are and what attributes we have by filling out these yeah. this form. It worked out what color we fall into a color code. So, like a lot of the players were in this red category, known right. for uh, tell me what to do, I'll do it. I just want to get on and do it, kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Me myself, I fell into a blue category, which was um, basically it was like the the pansy one, the one that's all about I love I love love people and I love getting on like that and and I really like the experience and I like hugs yeah. that kind of side of it, which I, I wasn't surprised that I was in that group. But like yeah, and that's that's think, when people yeah people respond to people respond to different ways of coach, and I think that's why as a coach you've got to understand that, and if you if you're only trying one method and one approach with every single player, it's not it's not going to work. You've got to understand what makes your players tick on and off the field. And, you know, some players, as you say, like the arm round them and say, you know, it's it's all right, where other players are just like, right, get back out there and, and get it done. Or as in, you know, Wayne Bobman's case, it's, you know, just get off your phone. <laughs> get off your phone. <laughs> get off your phone. <laughs> That's what we're saying to Joe Coyd at the moment. Get off your phone. Yeah, honestly, it's it's the best it's the best finding system I've uh, I've, I've seen for the last few years. It's great. I just got <laughs> back from Mauritius two weeks on inclusive thanks to Wayne Barton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, when we go when we talk about the 2017 World Cup, so that was your last time as an international coach. It was. Uh, I think. What a difference! What different um, tactics did you have going into that with the team? Obviously, because it was a similar team that we had to the Euros, except um, I think we, what was the the game plan at, at that? Yeah, I think you know, it's, I think we I think we blooded in a few more new players. I think Ryan Richardson obviously came onto the scene following twenty fifteen. Um, Harry obviously then 
um, obviously progressed within basketball even further, so he was un unavailable for selection. So I think there was a slightly different dynamic and, and way what we, we, we played. I think we were, I think in 2015, we had a, we had the basics of the actual rugby rugby style, but I think in two seven, uh, 2017, I think we we were a little bit more aggressive. We, we you know we could play with a little bit more less fearless. I think. Um, in certain ways, I think you know we, we were able to trust each other a lot more. And people might be looking at that and going, "Well, you won the Euros and you lost the World Cup." And it's, but if you look at the style of play that we we were adopting, you know, I think come 2021, I, I don't think France will keep up with that style of play because I think you know that was very much about okay, 2015 were great, but how do we get better? And I know we came up short in 2017, but. I think the way that England is shaping up now, I think you know it's very much about building for that future, and, and it's not just having your one to five that are strong. It's it's being able to look at your your bench and actually go, we've got like for like swaps here, and I don't think we've, we've I don't think we had that luxury for a long for a long time, and I think if we can get to that stage, I think that's going to be the making of England for two thousand and twenty one and beyond, really. Yeah, we, we, we uh, were talking about it this weekend with uh, Martin Coyd, and just he was. Um, comparing the two like now to back then as you know back in the day it was we sort of piggybacked along the ability the single abilities and in individuals performances yeah. to be able to beat someone one-on-one -on -one, whereas it's just it's just not enough for what uh one one or two players to be really to be better individually than than the opposing team anymore and players yeah, are definitely. getting smarter yeah, it's, it's 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 getting smarter, but equally, if if you've got a team of superstars, obviously, if you've got if you're relying on one or two players and that player gets injured, you know your, your game plans out the window. And I think I think what we've done over the last few years is is try to instill that. Okay, should somebody get injured, we can look at that next man who's coming on and have that ultimate trust and confidence that he's going to be able to do equally or a better job. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see it get to the point where, and I still say us because I, I still view that as, you know, I'm very much part of that team and that, that, that squad. I think it's something that will stay with me for the rest of the life. So, but I think, you know, if you look at the running game, some of the times you didn't start with your best 13. You know, you might have your best prop on the bench or your, or your best loose forward on the bench because then you're actually swapping and bringing strength in a different dynamic. And I think. I think England are building towards that now. I think they they will be in a position where they, where somebody can go on and, and do a job, but break teams down and actually bring in a different dynamic to the actual team, which will actually just you know it'll start to rip teams up a little bit, which which is good. Yeah, it's coming a lot like more chess, isn't it? We we yeah. employ one tactic, they they defend with another, and and vice versa, swapping it up that way. Once we can get that across the board with the depth on in the squad. Then and I think that's it. I think you've got to have that depth first and foremost. And if that takes four years, if it takes eight years, it's a journey that's been worthwhile. And you know, that started in 2014, bringing you know some younger players in. I think if you look at Nathan Collins now and, and how he's progressed from being in that environment, you know, they're, they're taking this back to club level, which is obviously making the, the the club competition better as well, which is which is great. But I think you know, if we can keep attracting young players to the game with a clear pathway of how they can progress to that international level, it can only be. It can only be good for the game, Jack. Yeah, and and I think the smart thing is, uh, which I really appreciated with you and Twig, was your approach to rugby was obviously uh, the progression of England, but also the sport in general. It it was always there that if it's if it's not beneficial for wheelchair rugby league, it it yeah. wasn't beneficial at all. And I like that idea. How we, were you guys constantly talking about the future of the sport itself, or? Yeah. or did you focus more on England and, and the players that way? I think you've I think you've got to wear two hats. I think that's the that's the hat we wore was okay, we've got here and now, you know, we wanna we wanna be successful here and now, but we we also understand that that's a journey for the long term. So I think you've got to look at your long term plan and understand what you want to do for the game. Um so you've got I refer to it as macro and micro. So your macro is long term. What do we look at like over the next ten years? How do we want to shape up how do we want to shape the game within the next 10 years and leave your legacy with any, with, not within wheelchair rugby league, but anything that you do. Um, and then the micro is, right, how do we work as fast as we can to actually get to where we want to be on that macro level? And I think 2015 was a, was a, was that first starting point. I don't think anybody expected us to win 
the Europe uh, yeah. Cup competition based on the adversity that we faced and the, the number of changes in the squad and, you know, obviously the coaching staff. Um, 2017, I still think, I think there was a little bit more expectation of us. And I think internally as well as externally, I think we'd obviously seen what we could do in 2015. Um, but equally, I think we still made massive strides, even though even though we lost in that final, because it still fits in with that long-term plan of the, the sport as a whole. So I think, yeah, I think, that's the one thing that Twig and I were quite good at is having that, okay, we need to focus on the here and now, but but what does that mean? What is the what is the long term and what do I want to see that look like for when I'm either not around or, you know, I think we talked a lot around succession and, you know, it's not just about the players, but what, what does the next set of coaching look like for England as well? You know, you want to, I think you want to bring people up to the level that you can be replaced. And I think if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job properly. You want to go, I'm leaving this job now, but here's my replacement and they're, they're ready to go. Yeah, I like that. And I like the, the fact that obviously we were supposed to be in Australia in 2017 and, until things yeah. changed. That's why, I stuck around. that's why I stuck around. Yeah, that's the oh, other reason. Like, you just thought, oh God, I'll get, I'll get this tournament <laughs> over with and then I'm off. This isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, uh, but like uh, Martin Coy's been saying, it, it's... It turned out to be really beneficial for the sport having that final there because I mean we haven't had a final World Cup or, or like the Euros and things anything like that uh, yeah. like France did and it was a massive occasion. But the um, twenty twenty one I don't know how much you you've heard about the twenty twenty one scene that we're looking at making it even bigger sort of thing and yeah I've I've, I've I'll be honest with you I watched from a distance now Jack so I still. I'm not. I've not disconnected from the game completely. I've obviously, you know, I've been busy in other areas in terms of I've not been around as much and not seen you guys. But yeah, I still keep a still keep a lookout. I know obviously things have changed now in terms of the pathway and that performance pathway for England. I can see the venues that are now coming up in terms of the wheelchair rugby league, and that's that's great because obviously if if we can start getting known on that presence and actually start to get the word around for that and the fact that it's running parallel with the World Cup as well, rather than just being its own isolated competition. Um, it can only be can only be good, Kai. Yeah, it has to be. Um, so yeah, like I say, you just uh, you stepped back a little bit now. You're still involved in rugby league in general with um, your company or franchise, Rugrats yeah. Rugby. Yeah. So can you just tell us the the scope for what that is and how it works? Yeah. So obviously, Rugrats um, started in 2011. Um, but for people that don't know the backstory, my, I lost my daughter in 2007. Um, she'd always wanted to work with children. I've always obviously been interested in rugby and business and was kind of looking for a way to, to bring back my life. And I know we're going to touch on the speaking in a bit, but um, you know I can quite openly talk about it now, Jack, but I couldn't before. And, and Wheelchair Rugby League actually played a big important part for this because what I didn't realise is I was operating from a bubble of grief and depression. Um, and by 2010, I was actually suicidal. Um, so, you know, I looked for a way back and how I could build something. And that's how Rugrats came about. It was, it was me saying, I need to sort my life out, but I need some focus. I'm, I'm not coping very well. What can I do? And, and, and that's how it came about. So I start, started a business with no previous business knowledge. Um, ignored the advice of saying, don't work with children and started a program that gets kids involved from as young as two years old. So, it, you know, it's... It's been a it's been a bumpy journey, yeah, one that I've obviously you know really enjoyed, and it's it's now going from strength to strength. That's good. So, and is that a, sort of all across the country? That how how does the business actually work? How does how how does it function? So I so I I own obviously the the business, and then we we adopt a franchise model, so people can start their own part time sports coaching business. So at the moment we're we're up as far as uh, the northeast and across to the northwest, and then predominantly in Yorkshire. Um, but I've been working hard over that since I left um, Wheelchair Rugby League to to now grow that. But obviously, that needed me taking a back step to put a few more foundation blocks in place, which I've done over the last eighteen months. Uh, and we're now going to be looking at that, making that UK wide. No, that's great. That's great, and and it's all about getting kids playing rugby league then. Uh, so it's not just rugby league. Obviously, due to the ages that they we start them from, um, we just we are rugby. Um, and you know, obviously, I'm, I'm a rugby league man because obviously my background. You know, I live on the M62 corridor, so therefore I uh, I must I must love rugby league. But I think it's it's more than just rugby. I think it's just a way of just getting kids active, getting them social, developing skills. I think if you look at that, 
we, we, we touched on it earlier about having a long-term plan. My long-term plan for me is, okay, how, how many number of kids can we get involved in, in rugby? Um, but first and foremost, how many kids can we get active and get them developing skills? Because a lot of the skills that we develop is helping them get ready for school, you know, things like listening, taking turns, taking instructions, things like that. So it's, it's not just about rugby, it's about actually developing kids. And that for me is that, that, that is the legacy that comes from Rugrats is how do we develop kids so they're actually being able to get a positive start, whether that be within physical activity or, you know, just being able to develop some skills that helps make that transition to school a little bit easier for them. Yeah, it plays a big role sport in what a lot of people don't realise is how uh, men, all the mental benefits it has and, and you can, it yeah. makes people feel happier in themselves but also at a kid level you're teaching communication friendship and and yeah. loyalty and things like that and it's all good good attributes to be carrying on into early is. childhood and i think if you if you know if you look at now we're starting people from as young as two years old and you know by the time they start playing under eights rugby whether that's rugby league rugby union or whatever or even if they go to football tennis cricket or ballet you know we've given them a we've given them some good foundations to be able to do that um, but you talk about that skill development. I think rugby is great for that because obviously you get the hand-eye coordination, the passing, the catching. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's it's really good in developing those those motor skills that they're going to need whether they continue to play rugby or not. Really. Yeah. And um, what? Uh, so we also have touched on you beginning to push on your motivational speaking. Yeah. Is that is, is that sort of just a, another? Add on from the rugrats and the coaching perspective, sort of thing. Is it some, or is it something you've sort of just happened upon? It's a really hard one, Jack, because because of the journey I've been on since the last few years. You know, obviously, looking at coming back from from losing my daughter and actually to where I am now, and I think it's just been a natural progression of that journey. Um, and now I feel that. I've been through a lot of pain and a lot of heartache, but there's a lot of skills there around resilience, courage, self-belief that I've actually identified and understood as I've been working within rugby and wheelchair rugby league that, you know, if I can help other people to actually look at their current situations, whether they're going through adversity or whether they're actually trying to get to that next level. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I love the sound of my own voice as well, Jack. So I just thought, I just thought speaking might be a good way to actually do that. But yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I think I've just naturally progressed into that. Um now I think, you know, last last weekend or the weekend before was a was me proving to myself that I could do it. Um it was the actual anniversary since I lost my daughter and I was on a speak retreat event and actually stood up and spoke about my story on that weekend and that for me was a, a way of saying of remembering my daughter but also saying I've proven to myself that I've actually rebuilt my life and I'm now ready to kick on and, and get to that next level. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm hoping that you know I come out of it and inspire others as I as I do that really. Yeah, I mean when you see you see a lot in um, motivational speakers and and coaches as well, people really do uh, really do react and and advance from as a good story. And it's it's probably not the right way to talk about your your, your past experiences with your daughter and things like that as a story. But when when you have a yeah. story, you can really get their messages across a lot better and people do yeah. take if you it cast your mind back as If you cast your mind back as well, Jack, if you look at every single campaign we've had, I've told a story in that in that in in them camps. It wasn't my story because obviously I wasn't ready to share it at that time, but I, you know, I shared a story of you know, George Hickinson, I shared a story of my grandma and that was just, you're just trying to engage people in a different way. As you say, people respond and react to different situations, different stories. And if, if you can just mentally just tap into somebody's resolve and actually say, we all go through pain, we all go through challenges, we all go through growth. I'm just letting you know that you can do it, you know, and I think that's the one thing that we've, we've that belief's been instilled now within Wheelchair Rugby League in the fact that the players involved and they believe they can do it. And I'm hoping that I can now take that beyond the sport and actually, you know, whether that's in the corporate world, charities, education, whatever that might be, you know, hopefully there's people out there that'll take some motivation and inspiration from my story and be able to, to look at their own life and think, okay, I've, I've got this, whether they're trying to get to the next level in their career or whether they're trying to get over the pain of something or whatever, I don't, I don't know. They're all transferable skills, aren't they? And, it and is, yeah. But I've actually yeah. titled my talk, I've actually titled my talk The Hard Yards. So it's got <laughs> that rugby theme in the fact that you made the hard yards, but it tells the story of how you can be resilient and 
get the right attitude and have some courage. Like you've got to do the hard yards to get where you want to be. So it's quite a, quite a fitting thing and still got a rugby theme. Oh, I like that, hard yards. That, yeah. that Mark's been giving, giving that speech as well last this weekend. Hard yards. Oh, did he make well, my speech you... as well as my tips? Yes, he is, oh, mate. He's, 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 oh, God. <laughs> Well, they called me through. They called me through at week actually and said, "I need, I need, a, I need some tips for this weekend. We've got a camp. You got many ideas." So I said, oh, yeah, you can have, you can have this one, mate." I'm only, jo- I'm only joking, Mark. He's a, he's a great coach. You know, I think um, credit to him as well. And I know we take the pee out of each other, but I genuinely enjoyed working with him. I think he's got a lot of, a lot of time for the sport. He's been patient and waiting for his opportunity. And I think, I think he'll do some great stuff on his own as well. I think, you know. When we were talking about 2017 and whether I was going to stay on or not, we, you know, we, we kind of called ourselves the Ant and Deck of Wheelchair Rugby League because obviously we were just known as the, the Groups and Tucson. But you know, I think he'll um, he'll add a lot of value, and I think he'll he'll kick on, and I I, I believe in him and the team to uh, to lift the trophy in 2021. Yeah, and uh, it's brought in um, Tom Coyd as the assistant coach now as well, who's doing a yeah, brilliant yeah. job. Well, they needed somebody good looking to replace me, you see. So obviously, they couldn't just couldn't just have Mark. He's made an improvement, mate. He's got hair. Ah, oh, well, yeah. He's a younger model, isn't he? You know, yeah. all, look, at, look at his dad. It'll happen. <laughs> so, on your motivational side, the motivational yeah. speaking. When you're talking, what I was going to say is, if you would, if you actually would do it, what would be your your quote or or speech for Halifax after? They, they lost that grand final. If you would what, even I'll, help them. I'll, I'll tell you what, Jack, I'll, I'll make you a commitment because I, I come back to the long-term plan. I'll actually come and do that. I'll actually come and have that talk with you at Halifax. Oh, I like that. That's good. I'll have to, yeah, I'll yeah. Have to, we'll have to book All that. All the Leeds fans have just switched off now and pressed the, uh, <laughs> the down thumb on, the, uh, on YouTube. Your phone uh, will be buzzing up. It'll be, uh, it'll be uh, James, James Simpson giving you hell now. Yeah, yeah. No, but I think, you know, if you look at if you look at it as a whole, it's an opportunity for me to share the story and, and how you deal with that and how you come back from that. And equally, it um, keeps leads on the toes. Yeah, well, you just got to keep, we've got to keep that um, that competition and that, that, we've got to keep it closer, though. We've got to build, up. from the wheelchair side, we, we really want to sort of build all these teams up internationally and at club level yeah. too, so we can get it competitive across the board. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, it, it is. But yeah, I'm, I'm more, than, more than happy to come and have a chat with you guys. No, that'd be awesome. We'll have to sort that out. Uh, just for the viewers listening then, will you get, can you give a top tip just for a single, if someone's brand new playing this sport and they're just getting into wheelchairs, but what would your initial goal be for them, the first thing they should overcome? Um, I don't think it's necessarily overcoming, but I think it's, I think my top tip would be patience. You know, things don't come within an hour, a week, a month, a year. You've got to have a little bit of patience um, and invest in yourself as well as your actual development. So if you're turning up for training once a week, but then you're going off and eating kebabs and stuff, you know, you've got to get yourself right. So work on yourself as well as you, as hard as you work on your, uh, your rugby league, really. Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Uh, how can we get in touch with Regrets Rugby or with... Um you personally to, to book you in um, so you can drop me a Facebook messenger because obviously we're, uh, we're friends and uh, for Rugrats Rugby people can just go online it's rugratsrugby.co.uk and obviously they've got all the details there on the website but equally they can just drop me uh, a message by the uh, contact form that's lovely so they can get them so I'm trying to see if we've missed anything on my pointers here we've gone over we've not covered the, uh, the English French guy who uh, called oh, me out yeah. on the, uh, the last podcast. So oh, yeah, don't, don't, don't want to miss that one. Yeah, the guy who made that. Oh, he made a song about you or something, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he made a song about me. I think. Obviously, I, I listened to his podcast, and obviously, some of it was true. Um, in terms of you know, it obviously a bit about him laughing during the national anthem and how he got banished to the stands from next one. Um, but we'd had a couple of complaints that I. Uh, it must have been eating garlic the night before. Um, and actually, they just said, do you mind if, if Seb goes and stands in the stands? Because it's a little bit off-putting. All we can smell is garlic when we're, uh, when we're trying to yeah. you know, get into a game. So that was, that's the real reason behind that. Is, you know, I think he took it personal and wrote a song about me, which you know, is quite heartfelt and touching. But, but equally, yeah, if you could just lay off the garlic, that would be uh, appreciated. <laughs> 
Is that, so that's where that smell were coming from. All right. Yeah, yeah, it was Seb, yeah. I was just looking after the team. <laughs> do we need to do we need to call out anybody else? Um no, I think they're fine. No, just Seb. We'll just we'll just give just, Seb just this. Seb. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, thank you for uh, being on and talking to us. They've got a, a lot of good tips in there and a lot of good uh, a good story that we've heard from you there. Welcome out and drop me a message and we'll uh, we'll book in a chat. Yeah, that's great, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. All the best. See, See you, you later. Soon.